Okay, so <laughs> welcome. Uh, as you can tell, we are using Zoom. This is the platform that we've been hosting all of our webinars on. If this is your first time Zooming, uh, that is totally fine. Welcome. Uh, just want to point out a few things. Your video and microphone should be off and muted because like we said, that helps the technology run a bit smoother. And they both can be done if you move your mouse down to the bottom of the screen and click on the little video and microphone icon and you should see a red line across them. When I'm in full screen, which I am right now, you sh you're, should be in full screen as well. If you need to exit, you can push the escape or push exit full screen. At the bottom of your window, you will see the chat button. Um, it's circled in blue on my screen. Click the chat button and that should dock next to the presentation. We will be using this a lot. This is how we will be communicating with everyone. Just make sure that when you send it, it says everyone um, because we'll be using that throughout the time. Beautiful. So a little bit about us. Uh, we are the Bird Conservancy of the Rockies. Uh, we have a three-pronged mission. We use our science team, our stewardship team, and our education team. And we all really work together and work really hard to integrate all of our branches so that we can ensure birds remain in our world for generations to come. Our science team, they're the ones that's advancing knowledge. They're out in the field. We do work all throughout the Rockies, up into Canada, down into Mexico. Our stewardship team are the people who are out working with those ranchers and farmers implementing everything. And then finally, our education team is we are hoping to inspire the next generation and we work with school groups, homeschools, summer camps, everything. So it's a fantastic group to be a part of. So our, our presenters, as I mentioned before, uh, my name is Stacy Monahan. I am the Camp and Family Programs Coordinator for the Bird Conservancy of the Rockies. We are based out in Brighton, Colorado on Bar Lake. And joining me in the chat window uh, is Chaley Jensen. She is our Nebraska Wildlife Education Coordinator. And she's based in Scotts Bluff, Nebraska. And we also have Tyler, uh, whose voice you heard earlier. He is one of our environmental educators, and he's also in the, the chat box too. Um, so if at any point you have any questions or comments during the webinar, and like I said, this is the tool that we will be using is that chat window, uh, please feel free to ask your questions in there. Shaylee um, and Tyler will be able to help you out and I'll be able to see it too. Uh, our, our favorite birds right now, and I do notice that my <laughs> presentation uh, got changed. The bird up top is our great gray owl. Um, that is my favorite one right now. So please excuse that it says bard. <laughs> um, but the great gray owl, I just think is magical and mystical and I still have yet to see one. Uh, they're very elusive. So that is something I would love to come across one of these days. And Shaylee's favorite owl right now is the cute little burrowing owl. So now that you know a little bit about us and our organization, uh, we would love to know about you. One of the great things about Zooming is that not only can we connect with the people in Colorado, but we can connect with everyone over the world. Uh, so to get to know you a little better, if you wouldn't mind typing in that chat box where you are watching from, how many people are watching with you, and let us know your favorite bird. We just want to see how many people will become future owl enthusiasts after this webinar. So I'll give everyone a minute or so to do that. <laughs> Lots of loving burrowing owls from Denver, we had Georgia, Strasburg, Lots of Colorado. Lots of burrowing owls, swallows. Just 
relocated back. Awesome, albatross. I love seeing that we have some younger kiddos on here as well. Love the great horned owl meeting pair, beautiful. Well, please keep those uh, coming in. We love to see it, just see where everyone's from. New Mexico, cool. Well, thank you. Like I said, please type those things in. We can see that as we continue on. So in this webinar today, we're going to explore all about owls. We're gonna learn specifically about their adaptations um, and what makes those adaptations so special and specific to our owls. We will also be able to identify some common owls we have around here and learn why owls are so important to our ecosystem. And just because we'll be focusing on some owls in Colorado, if you're not based in Colorado, chances are with some of these, you might still see them in your neck of the woods, either because of migration or just of their large range. So why birds? Uh, we could, there are amazing animals out there. We could focus on anything, but the Bird Conservancy of the Rockies, along with several other organizations, why do we put so much effort into studying birds? Uh, I think they're inspirational. They've been around <laughs> forever. Uh, going back, you can see artwork. We get engineering ideas from them. They're just an, a magnificent creature. They're accessible. No matter where you live, you can find birds, whether you're in the heart of New York City or living out in the country. Albeit, you might be seeing different species and might not have as wide a range of birds you can see, but they are still there. They're an ecosystem service. They control pests. They really help out with seed dispersals in certain forests. And they're environmental indicators. Birds are one of the first groups to be affected by environmental changes. And if you haven't, um, just last year, one of our aviation conservation scientists, Arvind Punjabi, helped publish three billion birds gone um, since 1970. It was a big collaboration. And there are canaries in the coal mine, essentially, telling us something is going on, but it's also giving us ways that we can help birds out. It's a great article. If you haven't gotten a chance to look at it, you can Google it. Tyler just put it in. Thank you. So just a fun little facts. We have about 10,000 species of birds worldwide. In North America, 1,000. Colorado, we narrow that down to about 507 species. And at Bar Lake, which is where the Bird Conservancy of the Rockies is headquartered in Brighton, there are 350 species. So if you are lucky enough to be in the area, we definitely say check out Bar Lake. It is a birding hotspot with its range of habitats um, and migrants that come through. It's a really amazing area. So we are going to get into it right now. So using your chat box, uh, I want you to think, what are some adaptations that owls have? Now, does anyone know what is an adaptation? Before we ask you what specific ones they have, what do you think? And you can type it in the chat box. So what is an adaptation? And I see a couple of people already giving great examples of an eye. They have big eyes. Yeah, turn their head around. So an adaptation is something that either a plant or an animal has that helps it survive in its environment. Yeah, it's either something physical, like you're saying um, it has like a hooked beak or something behavioral, like the ability to migrate. So now what do you think that some adaptations that owls have? We see blends in, can turn its head, nocturnal vision, Special feathers for silent flight. What else? Nest locations. Two eyes facing forward and not on the side. 
keen hearing. Awesome job, everyone. And keep them coming in. Um, I will pull them up. So here is a general list. And a lot of these, they can fly fast. <laughs> cuteness, cuteness can be an adaptation, I like to think. So they're pretty awesome. Um, but I have a list up here. Most of these things you all have stated in the chat box. So great job. And what we're going to do is we're going to dig deep into each of these adaptations and, and learn a bit more about it. Now, there are a handful of general characteristics and adaptations for raptors. And raptors are our birds of prey, like our eagles, our hawks, our owls are in there. And if you're really keen on getting to know that grouping of birds, we do have two webinars that are posted up on our YouTube channel about raptors. We have raptors 101 and raptors 201. So you will see some of those same adaptations. But what's really cool is that our owls take it to the next step. So let's dig deeper and see exactly how some of these adaptations work. And just as a side note, this owl, does anyone know? I have a guess as to what owl this might be by this photo. Uh, this owl I was lucky enough to work with. I worked for a little over a year at a place, Environmental Education Center in California, and we had a permit to have raptors. So I was lucky enough to, to get this photo of a great horned owl. Great job, everyone, of our great horned owl when we put him up on the tree. It was right after fresh snowfall. So pretty spectacular birds. So we'll start off, a lot of you all said the eyes and you could really see in that photo prior that that great horn was staring right at us. They have binocular vision and someone had mentioned their eyes on the front hunt, eyes on the, eyes on the side hide. Uh, so they are a, a predator. They have great binocular vision, which basically means they have depth perception. So when an owl is perched, you can think in a tree and is looking and listening for its prey. When it swoops down, it knows when to drop down its talons to grab that prey and is not hitting the ground instead. Uh, so that depth perception really, ha really helps and you can see it up there. Someone had also mentioned night vision. So most owls are awake at night. They are nocturnal and they have something in their eyes and we do too called rods and cones. Just out of curiosity, does anyone know what rods and cones do? You can type it in the chat box. Yeah, rods and cones help us see for sure. And they each have a specific job. Yep, rods are for low light, cones are for color, exactly. So if you think about it right now, what do you think our nocturnal owls would have more of? Rods, which kind of help see in low light, they see a bit more of the shapes, or cones, which help you see color. <laughs> yeah, everyone's going in, rods, for sure. They definitely have more rods in their eyes because they don't need to see the color. Awesome job. So along with their amazing eyesight that, that can really help them, something that goes along with it is their eyes. Their eyes are generally very large and cone-shaped. It's almost like a, a long pointy ice cream cone. But right now what I want you to do, even though I can't see you, is see if you can make some crazy eyes. Move your eyeballs all around. All right, I have a great picture in my mind of everyone making crazy eyeballs right now. Uh, because we can. <laughs> if, if, you, if you can't do it, maybe you should talk to a doctor, but we can move our eyeballs. Owls, because they're so big, they can't. They are fixated, they're immobile, they are stuck in place. Which leads us to 
our next amazing adaptation. So because they can't move their eyeballs, how many degrees do you think an owl can turn its head? So keep in mind, a circle is 360 degrees. So how far do you think an owl can turn its head? 180, 270, 180, maybe a little more, 280, 300. Great guesses, everyone. And we always like to encourage, even if you're not sure about an answer, feel free to guess. That's how we learn. We're a very non judgmental crew. So I love seeing all the guesses. And it is actually. 270 degrees. So great job, everyone, for uh, those of you who guessed it. And thank you for those of you who put out an answer. Here's just a really cool diagram that we have. So the reason why they can turn it 270 degrees is because like we said, they, they have to be able to see like us, if we want to look to the right and we don't want to turn our head, we can move our eyes and generally see what's over to our side. Owls can't do that. Owls have to turn their entire head. And one of the reasons they can do that is because they have lots of vertebrae in their neck. So if you were to bend your head down and feel in the back of your neck and feel your vertebrae, humans have seven vertebrae. Does anyone have any guesses as to how many vertebrae owls have in their neck? And you might be able to see if you can read the fine print or count <laughs> on the diagram. 14, 18, 20, 10, 12, 60, a lot, <laughs> nine. Great guesses. Uh, they actually have double the amount. So they do have 14 vertebrae in there. So that's one of the reasons why they can move their head that 270 degrees. So what's really cool is that a group of scientists at Johns Hopkins University, including medical illustrator Fabian de Koch Mercado and neuroradiologist Felipe Gaud, used CT scans and a bunch of other cool things to examine the anatomy of about a dozen snowy, barred, and great horned owls. Um, they all died from natural color, excuse me, natural causes. And what they found is that they have these specific adaptations to prevent them from injury, from moving their head so fast around. That's why a lot of people think, oh, they can turn their heads all the way around because of that. So one of the big things that helps them is at the base of the head, they have something called contractile reservoirs. And this is essentially where the blood pools and that allows the owls to turn their heads so radically because they still have enough blood there to feed the eyes and the brain. So it's a little reservoir that holds it. So even if they're turning, they're still able to get blood flow and oxygen to their brain, which obviously is crucial. What's even cooler is that they have a really complex supporting vascular network. So if you look in the diagram, you can see kind of two main arteries going up their vertebrae. So the scientists discovered that owls have small vessels connecting between the car carterid and the vertebral arteries that allow blood to flow between the two vessels. So what this means is that even if one route is blocked, let's say because of you know, the owls turning its head in extreme direction one way, the other artery can still get blood up to the owl's neck and brain, which is really, really cool. We do not have that same adaptation. Humans get whiplash far too easier. If we had an adaptation like the owl, we would be much better off. So our owls have large eyes, which we found they can't move. So they have the 14 vertebrae to help them move their head along with other awesome adaptations so they don't cut off the blood flow. So that they can see their prey and also so they can hear it. 
However, where are an owl's ears? What do you think? You can type in, where do you think you find an owl's ears on their head? Side of the face, side of the head, on top of the head, on the sides. Awesome, I love the guesses. So here's our hearing and you are correct. I see, put a bunch of your comments together and we have the correct answer. So in the top picture, you see that's a little Northern saw wet owl and the banders pushing apart the feathers to see its ears. So they are on the sides of the face of an owl. It's just like a little ear flap. It's an opening in the skull. And what's really cool is that depending on the owl species, their ears, well, their ears are asymmetrical, but it varies how far apart they are depending on the species. So for instance, if you think if you were to draw a line down the middle of our face right now, on either side, our ears are in the same place. We are symmetrical. But if you were to draw that same line down an owl's face, maybe on the right side, the owl's ear is really up towards the top of its head. And on the left side, it might be really down further lower. So that's called asymmetrical. Really cool adaptation that they have. What it, that allows them to do is to essentially triangulate so pinpoint where sound is coming from. And what helps them do that is their facial discs. A lot of times if you look at an owl, it kind of seems like they have a round face. So their facial discs surrounding their face, it's a ring of feathers that help gather sound. It's kind of like a satellite dish that collects the signals. And each one of those feathers is movable and can change position to better funnel the sound to their ear openings. So they can turn their head, they can move those facial discs along with that asymmetrical hearing so that they can figure out exactly where that prey is coming from. And what they do is they have what's called a sound location memory. This means that when they hear a sound, they can make a map in their brain of where that sound is coming from relative to their location. So they can do this because special cells in a distinct part of their brain are sensitive to sounds in different areas. So this is what allows them to find that sound. So you can think of it like this. If you've ever played Marco Polo, or if you are a camper that has gone to, to one of our camps or maybe even an outdoor ed school played bat moth. You'll remember that when you close your eyes, you still usually have a good idea of where the people are around you. This is because you can hear them and kind of place them on your own mental map. So it's similar to what these birds and owls are doing. So like we said, owls still, have, some of them have good vision, but some of them like the barn owl, hunt so strictly at night in super darkness that they really rely upon their ears. And like we said, those are even very asymmetrical apart to really help with that triangulation. So next, we're gonna go over another adaptation that really helps them to stalk their prey and was also mentioned. Their feathers. So if you look at the top picture, you will see that it's kind of comb-like on top. This is the leading edge of the primary wing feathers. So essentially, if you look at the bottom picture, the part of the wing and the feather that hits the air first, that is that leading feather. And that has these little comb-like, or they're called flutings or fimbrae on those feathers. This breaks down the turbulence that happens when they hit the air into little groups called microturbulences. 
and that effectively muffles the sound of the air rushing over the wing and allows them to fly silently. And a lot, if you've ever gotten a chance, if you've seen us at a booth, a lot of times we have a, a bio fact of, of a wing that you can gently touch. And yeah, a lot of times they are really soft, but those leading feathers are generally a little stiffer, but they have those flutings on the edge to break up that sound. You can think of it where if you've been walking in a park or near a pond and there's either geese or ducks and you startle them and they take off, you can hear them. <laughs> you know, they are not quiet at all. Um, because if you were to look at their leading feathers on their wings, it is blunt. It would be blunt. There would be no flutings on it because there's no need for, you know, the goose to sneak up on its prey. That's why our owls are so keen, um, keen hunters, because they also have this silent flight. So we've gone over their eyes and their hearing and their silent flight. But what happens, and all this is so they can catch their prey, what happens once they catch it and eat it? There's another really cool adaptation that our owls have. Does anyone have any guesses to how many stomachs an owl might have? All right, I see lots of twos, couple threes, two to four, maybe four. Awesome guesses, everyone. Let's find out. They have two, so great job. If you notice um, up top, we have a picture of what it looks like to be a, a drawing of a great horned owl and the anatomy inside of it. And underneath is our owl pellet. Uh, if you're lucky enough, usually in elementary school or if you went to an outdoor ed uh, or environmental center, you've probably dissected one of these. I think it's a lot of fun. <laughs> My campers usually enjoy it too. So what happens is that most owls, if they're able, will take their food down in one gulf. If they catch something that they're able to do that, like a vole or a mouse. And they don't spend a lot of time plucking feathers off or plucking the fur off. So what happens is once it goes down, through the esophagus, it hits that first stomach, which you can see is the proventriculus or the glandular stomach. And that's where it has all the acids and chemicals to help break that food down. And there's also a mucus in there that helps to separate the digestible versus the indigestible parts of that prey that they had. So once that starts to get going and starting to get dissolved, it then pushes it down into the second stomach, which is the ventriculus, you can see it on our diagram, or the gizzard. And this is like the filter, and that's what holds the bones, the fur, the teeth, the feathers. If it swallowed a, a songbird and maybe it had a band on it, this is where the band would be. Um, and it's very muscular and it will compress it into a pellet. So it squeezes it together into a pellet. And generally this process can take several hours. And once it's pressed it into a pellet, it pushes it back up and it actually sits in the proventriculus or that glandular, that first stomach. Does anyone have a guess for how many hours it might sit there for? So once that pellet is made, gets pushed up. Three, six. Three, yep, six, four, seven, two. Six. Six, yeah, eight. Great guesses, everyone. So what they've actually found is it stays in there. Oh, looks like Clara got it on the higher end for about 10 hours. So, during those 10 hours when it's hanging out there, the owl 
can't eat. So it's not going to be hunting. It's able to hunt after it coughs it up. So what the owl will do is it'll kind of extend its neck. It closes its eyes sometimes. It opens its mouth and go bleh. That's a great sound, right? And it coughs, we call it coughing up a pellet or regurgitating, and it falls down. And then they're able to hunt again. So usually when an owl coughs up a pellet, you know that it's ready to eat again. I know when we were taking care of our great horned owl, that picture you saw earlier, if we went into its mew to feed it and we didn't see a pellet, we knew he was not going to eat the mice that we would bring in there because he couldn't. It was only after you found that little pellet on the ground that he would be hungry again. And yes, even the young in the nest, they cough up pellets. It probably, depending on what part they get from the adult, um, it might not contain as much fur because if they eat a lot at once, um, that it'll all compress together into, into one pellet. So really cool. Uh, generally, you can find these at the base of trees and you can even order them online uh, if you are looking for something to do during this uh, quarantine time we have. Is the bigger the bird, the bigger the pellet? Great question. And so the pellet reflects the size of that second stomach or that gizzard. So I guess, yeah, generally speaking, um, if it's a larger bird, it'd probably have a bit larger of a gizzard. So it would be a bit of a, a larger pellet. Well, great questions, everyone. So now that we've kind of really gone into those adaptations, specifically of owls, we're going to take a broader look at the owls and the family and how to find them and what some of the common ones are we have out here. So our owls, they are within the order Strigiformes and the family Strigidae, which are our true owls, and Titanidae, which are our barn owls. We have over 200 species of owls in our world. Out here in the West, we have around 19 species. Most are nocturnal. Uh, and like we said before, that means they come out at night. But as with many things in life, especially with animals, our owls did not get the field guide saying, you only come out at nighttime, or you need to look exactly like this. So we have some owls that do not come out at night and come out more during the day. Does anyone have a guess as to what one of the owls that are diurnal or come out during the day that we have out around here? Yeah, there are, the one that I was thinking of really common is our burrowing owl. They're a great owl to see during the day. Awesome. So we have to keep that in mind. Most owls are nocturnal, some are diurnal, and there's even a really fancy word. Uh, does anyone know the word that means dawn and dusk? If an owl comes out, you know, right at dawn, right at dusk, begins with a C. Anyone know that? You can type it in. Yeah. Good job. Crepuscular. That's one of my favorite words. We have lots of smart people on here. So uh, crepuscular is when an animal comes out kind of at that dawn and dusk time. So all different times kind of depends on the species. Owls are varied in their voices. Because like we said, most owls are nocturnal, it's a lot harder to go out birding, if you will, for them. So one of the main ways we do that is to ID them by their call. Um, another way, if you are trying to look for a specific owl, is during the day, go out to that specific habitat that you're thinking about that you know they might live in and look for clues. What do you think I mean when I say you should look for clues as to if an owl might be in that particular habitat? What can you find? 
Yep, our owl pellets, like we just said, they tend to be the, the base of trees. Yep, the whitewashing or, or the poo burrows. Yep, if, you, if you're looking for the burrowing owl, like those prairie dog homes, fur. Yeah, <laughs> nests, yep, feathers. Perfect, so these are all great ways that you can find during the daytime and then bundle up, <laughs> go out with a partner and see if you can find them at night. I know I spent many a college night with my ornithology professor, Dr. Alan Strong over at the University of Vermont going on, we would call them silly owling trips because there wasn't a whole lot of time that you would find them, but you always had fun on the search. <laughs> uh, and of course, the biggest thing is, is listening for them. Cool. So go on an owling adventure now is a great time to, to do that. So we are going to go over five owls that we have kind of in our area. So what do we think this owl is? We've talked about it. It is the most common and widespread owl we have in North America. Yeah, these are our great horned owls. And you can see one is up there. And right now, this is the time of year um, where they have their, their babies, their, their fledglings or the branchers, if they're going out onto the branch, uh, our juvenile owls, they look extra fluffy and kind of like old men. <laughs> um, I, I don't know. I just think they're really cute, but you have that one in the, the top picture up there. Has anyone ever seen one of these before? And if you have, would you mind typing in where you saw it? That was look like Muppets, yep. In Austin, Texas. Oh my gosh, Tyler. Fur Furbies, I completely forgot about them. Yes, I agree. Bear Lake, Boulder, you have a pair in your yard. Falcon, Colorado. In Fort Collins, you watch the fledglings every year. Westminster, it's our first one in Lincoln, Nebraska. Yeah, what's really cool, like I said, is they're really adaptable. Um, you can find them pretty much anywhere, whether you are in the middle of a city or out in the country. I know I live out in Westminster, big apartment complex. There's lots of shops right next to us, right behind train tracks, and there's still a great horn that at the beginning of the mating season always hangs out here. So it's a really cool owl. They are nocturnal, like we said, but you can also see them during the, the crepuscular time. Um, they eat medium-sized mammals, but because they are a larger, kind of bulkier owl, they will go after skunks and large rabbits. Um, they have those little ear tufts, and it's one of my favorite words, is the plumicorn. So those are called plumicorns. Uh, you're welcome. It's a great word. Share it with everyone. <laughs> and does anyone know what they're used for? Does anyone have any guesses? what those plumicorns are used for? To funnel sound to the ear. Yep, to collect sound. Warmth maybe, showing emotion. Yeah, awesome guesses. Um, ornithologists or people who study birds aren't 100% sure, at least nothing that I have found directly yet. Maybe funnel sound. I have heard that it might help with their camouflage, so blending into those trees, um, showing emotion, communicating to other owls. Great guesses. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to play, um, play a song. A song. <laughs> I'm going to play their call. <laughs> Sorry, I was, I was looking at the song I will play of theirs. So these are kind of a classic owl. They have deep, soft hoots, kind of with a stuttering rhythm. So hopefully everyone will be able to hear this. <laughs> it's 
So that, ooh, 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 ooh. sorry, I'm not a true um, <laughs> impressionist. Uh, that's the common call that you hear. And I will also put on a duet. So this is what you might have heard back in, in March where there's a pair of them that are calling to each other. So you can hear that one is a bit higher pitched and the other is a bit lower pitched and they kind of do a duet with them. So really cool bird, uh, really great. You can hear that most evenings. That's really cool, especially around that dust time. All right. Our next one, what do we think this one is? You have a guess? Some barn owls, maybe a snowy owl. Great guesses. So this is actually our barn owl. Snowy owls don't have that beautiful buffness that's all encompassing. encompassing. Snowy has uh, pretty much all white. And judging by their name, a lot of times they do like to take up uh, spaces in there we go. Uh, in barns, they'll, they'll roost in barns. They're kind of a medium sized owl. They have that beautiful white heart face with that kind of spotty chest. Neither are the ones that we talked about are strictly nocturnal. They have very asymmetrical ears um, and it hunts over agricultural lands a lot of times and it eats the small mammals. So you can think that a farmer would love to have barn owls near them because they might be eating those little rodents or mice that are attacking their fields. And they're found in grasslands kind of all over the world. Um, when well, you said they do come out at night, but you never know when you can see them. Just last year at the old stone house where we work in Brighton, we were out looking at some other birds, but there was a dead snag um, next to us. So a dead tree that had a cavity in it. And we just happened to look over and there was a barn owl chilling in there. Um, it didn't stay too long, it flew off and we never saw it again, but you just never know. So it was really cool. And if you've ever heard their call before, I'll give you a warning, it's kind of a hissing shriek. So we'll listen and, and you can tell me what you think it sounds like. Sounds like a dragon, a screech, a rat. Yeah, they have a very hissing shriek. I would personally probably be a little afraid if I had walked into a barn late one night um, and heard that. River plus a baby scream. Yeah, I love heard baby screamings. <laughs> um, so that is our beautiful barn owl. What about this one? We've talked about it a handful of times. Yeah, our little burrowing owls, all of their little like head, head cocked to the side. So these ones, like we said, are diurnal, meaning that they come out during the day. Uh, they're also to be found on our open grasslands and agricultural lands. Last year, we were lucky enough to have a pair that bred and had successful fledglings out no. at Bar Lake uh, State oh. Park. Uh, however, we did not see them return this year, unfortunately, but we have hopes for next year. Maybe they'll be back. They are a very small bird. They only stand about 10 inches tall and they eat very small rodents and lots of insects. They're kind of a ground forager. Uh, you can find them where prairie dog colonies are. These guys really like taking over those burrows because as you can see, they, they nest and roost in those underground, underground places. Uh, but because of that, 
their numbers have actually been declining because if you think about where you see your prairie dogs, a lot of times it's those open spaces where then buildings get built and cover up and dig up those prairie dog holes. So their habitat is kind of being destroyed, but something that uh, scientists have found is that they will use the PVP pipes, you know, those plastic long pipes, and they will actually make artificial burrows in there. So if you think about it, you know, lots of these things are all connected to one another. You might see prairie dog, for some people they're cute, some people they might think of them as a nuisance, um, but it is all connected. So that's a really keen place. So if you want to go out, find where some good pr prairie dog colonies are and look kind of at the openings of the holes. They blend in um, very, very well with that. So beautiful. Here's a tricky one. What do we think about this little fella? What do we think? Spotted, pygmy, screech. Oh, <laughs> yeah, it kind of looks like a screech. Yeah, it's actually our little flammulated owl. A little flam flam. Ooh. And sorry, I did say the wrong name of those little pipes earlier. <laughs> Thank you for correcting. Whoa. There we go. Um, so it's our flammulated owl. <laughs> it is. They're once again really small, smaller than our burrowing owls. They're about six inches. They are very much insectivores. Where you find these guys is near the tops of really big, massive pine tree or fir trees. Um, they like forests with large trees and they're really highly migratory. You can see at the bottom, um, there's the range map, which we always you know, tell our campers to double check if they see a bird to make sure would we see it here this time of year. And it's very small spots throughout Colorado that we have them. Not a lot is known about these birds just because of their migratory path. They are really high up in the trees and they're very nocturnal. Uh, what's super cool is that even though they're a small bird, they have an unusually large windpipe, a trachea that allows them to make a very low pitch hoot, which makes it sound like a much larger owl than it actually is. You can think that might help it out in case there are any predators out there. So like we said, they're definitely insectivores. They really like crickets and moths and beetles. And along with it is their, their population is in decline. So partners in flight had estimated a global breeding population of 5,500 flammulated owls. It could be because of a couple of reasons. They have a very low reproductive rate and is found mostly in older forests, which sometimes can be under pressure for logging. So there might be some habitat loss along with uh, flammulated owls may be extra sensitive to any pesticides that affect their insect prey. Um, we have actually a guest speaker who's coming to our online camp tomorrow. His name is Scott Yanko. He teaches over at UC Denver and is in the process of getting his PhD. And he is studying flammulated owls. So a couple summers ago, he came up to our camp, which is in Allen's Park, Colorado. So it's right outside of Estes Park and set up mist nets to see if we could find any. And we were not able to capture any. So a mist net is kind of like this big, very fine netted mesh that we can put up with poles. Um, we weren't able to get any, but we heard them, which is super exciting because he wasn't even sure if there were going to be any out there, but we heard a male calling back. So his research is doing to try and figure out what's their migratory patterns, like how can we help save these awesome little flammulated owls. Um, and I will play you their call as well. well here's their song first. <laughs> 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 
Yeah, so you can kind of hear that. Um, what always gets me is that, ooh, ooh. Um, it just, you, once you hear it, you're like, oh, that's what we heard. And that's what we heard that night we were trying to, to miss net them. So once again, really awesome bird. Um, we're doing our best to, to find more research and figure out what we can do to, to help them. And this is our last one here. What do we think this uh, fella is? Let's see, screech, it's bigger than a screech. That's a really good guess though. It's cute, yep, it's very cute looking. <laughs> Great guesses, not quite a great horn. I can see where you're thinking though. Looks like a stretched out great horn. Yeah, it really does. And someone did mention it, long-eared owl. So it is a long ear. there we go. Great job, everyone. So it's our long-eared owl. And like we said, they are kind of lanky and they have that surprised expression on their faces, especially in that lower picture I see. And it looks like, whoa, what's happening? Uh, they roost in very dense forests, and they also hunt over grasslands for, for small mammals. If you do go out owling and try and find this fella, um, a lot of times in winter, they nest in large roosts together, so they might, might be easier to find, <laughs> even though they, as you can tell, they have fantastic camouflage, so it makes them very hard to find. Um, they are also nocturnal. Uh, a fun fact, is I know that we've had them out at, I think is it a fir stand out at Bar Lake? Um, there's this big row of trees because it's right up against that grassland. So if you're looking for them, think where's their kind of dense trees, dense pines um, along with that grassland. And a few years ago, I'm actually not quite sure how long, but we actually caught one of these at our mist nets down at Chatfield. Um, so, <laughs> It was probably very early morning, you know, that crepuscular time. He ended up in the net, all was well, but a really cool, cool thing. So in spring and summer, what to listen for is kind of their long and low hoots. So once again, I will play this for you. Awesome. And they're spaced out very evenly, the, those hoots. Um, it's a really cool owl that, that once again we have around here. So here are the five owls. I do want to be respectful of your time and I know we got started a few minutes late because of our so a couple of technical difficulties, but I do just want to play. Let's have a, a little challenge. I'm going to play one of the songs from our owls and I want you to type in the chat box uh, if you know what it is. So I will pull up one of our birds and we'll just get our brains working. All right, here we go. Awesome, it seems like we are torn between the flammulated and the great horn. Uh, that is the flam, our little flam flam. So great job. And here's our great horn just for reference. Yay. 
Yeah. So the first one was the flammulated. That second one was our great horned owl. Awesome job, everyone. Like I said, owling, you really have to, to focus in on those sounds. So just to kind of wrap up, I want everyone to, to take a minute and think, why does this matter? Why would conserving owls matter? And think about it and you can type it in the window. And I did see, I will play our burrowing owl. I did forget to play that. Thank you for reminding me um, at the end. But why, why should we care about conserving our owls? What do you think? Why should we care about the declining populations of our burrowing owls or the flammulated owl? to keep rats down, they're part of our ecosystems, they balance us out. Yeah, circle of life, keystone species, keep other species numbers down. Yeah, all of these, and feel free to keep typing, they're all amazing answers. Um, they are not only a key part of our ecosystem and in certain respects, key uh, keystone species, but it's, it's kind of our, our responsibility, you know, and, it, and like we said, everything is connected. So if the burrowing owl is, you know, losing habitat or if the flammulated owl is losing habitat, part of it is probably because of us humans. So we can think, what can we do? Like if we have to cut down that forest, what else can we do to supplement it? Because the healthier of a landscape we have, the healthier we are going to be as well. Um, someone had mentioned, you know, wish we could have them as pets. The Migratory Bird Treaty Act in 1918, it's our oldest wildlife protection. It basically protects birds from people so that you can't hunt, own, kill, import, export, anything. The reason why we are able to have certain biofacts or, or stuffed um, birds is because we have a special permit the place that I worked at prior at the Environmental Education Center, same thing, they had a permit. Nature's Educators, um, the Birds of Prey Foundation, they work with raptors and they also have lots of owls that we use as ambassadors because they can no longer be safely released into the wild. So now we can use them to help teach people about these amazing, um, amazing birds that we have. So great job, everyone. Um, thank you so much. Uh, we hope that you do keep in touch with us. We have our weekly webinars. Make sure you check on our Facebook events page, on our website event page. Feel free to always email us if you have any ideas of things you would like to see. Uh, it's a pleasure hanging out with you all this morning. Um, and if, once again, if you made a donation, thank you. If you're thinking about it, we really appreciate it. That is how we're able to, to stay afloat and keep, um, keep offering these programs. And I will play the burrowing owl right now in case. So that's our little burrowing owl. Um, they don't call quite as much. Uh, we can see them a lot easier, but great job, everyone. Um, no, uh, no more upcoming OWL uh, webinars. We can get more into it uh, potentially. So if that's something of super keen interest, uh, send us an email, let us know. Um, yeah, that, that burrowing owl, you can definitely think it blends in with those prairie dog whistles that they have. Uh, more, <laughs> more. We will, we will definitely keep doing more. Um, I said, want to be respectful of everyone's time today. So thank you all so much. Keep an eye out on what we have coming for you. Um, and we hope to virtually see you all around. So thank you again, everyone, and stay safe.